You're listening to the Sunday podcast from Life Point Church in Santan Valley, Arizona. We hope you are encouraged by today's message. For more information, visit us online at lifepointaz.com. Open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Chapter 9 is where we're going to be in the Word of the Lord today. And 10. As we take a look at what Paul um, is going to talk about his apostleship. He's going to talk about authority and right that he has as an apostle, as a speaker of the gospel, and how he has laid those rights down, why he has done it. Where does his self-control come from? Where does his ability to continue to pursue Christ in the face of beatings and betrayals come from, right? He's going to talk about that, and then he's going to talk about how you and I can have that. And then at the end, he's going to talk about a crown. He's going to talk about living this life of faith in such a way that you win the prize, right? He's using an, an analogy here of the uh, Corinthians who would participate in the Ismanium Games or the Olympic Games. But what I want us to see, which is most important here this morning, is what was Paul's crown? What is Paul's prize? What was Paul's heart's desire? What is it that drove him to, to do all of this? I got to spend this week with my brothers and my parents. Uh, we had a bit of a family reunion of sorts uh, up in Sholo for Monday through Friday, and I got to hang out with them. It was a great time, a uh, refreshing time to see them. And he and I got into a conversation of uh, Paul's life and I said, one of the things for me, you ever have doubts of your faith creep in? You know, you just sort of, is all of this true? Did a virgin really give birth to a child 2,000 years ago? Do, am I waking up this morning and getting dressed and brushing my teeth, hopefully, and coming to church to worship a God that I've never seen? Is, I mean, I, I believe he's there, but, but is he? You know those doubts that just sort of sometimes creep in and you would never admit that you have them for fear of being smitten by the Lord, the almighty smiter? And yet, I'm getting a ton of feedback when I move right there. If there's a way to stop that. Otherwise, I won't move right there. Um, one of the things for me, whenever those doubts try to sneak into my mind and tell me this is all bogus, is I just look at Paul's life and I say, no, that doesn't happen. You can be deceived as a child. You can grow up into something. You can be deceived by persuasive speech. There are many, many, many men and women in this world who have been brought into a belief or a religious uh, scheme or a financial scheme because they were deceived into something. But the thing with Paul is Paul wasn't deceived into anything. Paul was incredibly brilliant had everything that a man could want, was in the faith of Yahweh, the one and only God, that had the prophets and the miracles and the kings and a rich, rich history. He believed Yahweh. And he then was at the height and the pinnacle, the Sanhedrin of, of religious leaders who would believe in this God. He too was waiting for the Messiah that was promised to come. Why did he give all that up for a life of beatings and betrayals and, as he's going to talk about here, not receiving a single dime from anybody, even though he could? It just, it doesn't make sense unless he actually encountered God on the road to Damascus. It doesn't make sense. He wasn't deceived. He wasn't promised a better life. He wasn't promised riches. He, there was no conceivable reason that this man would give everything up. Now, we see men all the time in our day give up their day jobs to join ministry, and they become wealthy because they're great speakers, and they build a great base, and before you know it, they're living in the nicest houses and flying in private jets. Fine, whatever. Paul didn't do any of that. There was no reward for him. In fact, because of his beliefs, there would only be death. There would only be blasphemy with the beliefs that he grew up in for what he was doing. Paul's life is a miracle. Paul's life is one of the most beautiful examples we have of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That he was real. That he came and walked this earth and that he set forth a new time period, a new age, a new era, so to speak. And so I want you to keep that in mind. 
as we read 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 1. This is Paul speaking. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, at least I am to you. <clears throat> For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. So this is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to food and drink? Do we not have the right to be accompanied by a believing wife as do the other apostles and brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who at any time pays the expenses for doing military service? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock and does not get any of its milk? Do I say this on human authority? Does not the law also say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it is treading out grain. Is it really for the oxen's sake that God is concerned? Or does he not speak entirely for our sake? It was indeed written for our sake, for whoever plows should plow in hope. Whoever threshes should thresh in hope of a share in the crop. If we have sown spiritual good among you, is it too much if we reap your material benefits? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we still more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share what is sacrificed at the altar? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing this so that they may be applied in my case. Indeed, I would rather die than that. No one will deprive me of my ground for boasting. But if I proclaim the gospel, then I have no ground for boasting. For an obligation has been laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim it. Woe to me, what would happen to me if I did not proclaim the gospel? For if I do this of my own will, then I have a reward. But if not of my own will, then I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation, I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. I want to take a minute there. My rights. How often as an American do you use the phrase or hear the phrase, it's my right. I have the right to be angry. I have the right to do this. I have the right to certain social um, amenities. I have the right to air conditioning. Now that one though, that one might actually be in there. We'll have to do some more theological study. But air conditioning in the desert is a right. I have the right, Paul says, I have made my case over the last 17 verses that I have every right to receive payment for bringing the gospel of Christ to you, for loving you, for teaching you, but I am refusing and letting go of that right so that there might not be any obstacle in your minds or the generations to come that the Lord Jesus Christ is real. Isn't that amazing? I will let go of what is rightfully mine. And see, what he's doing is he's preparing them for the words that are about to come next. Because if they thought that that was tough or interesting, he's getting ready to ask them to do the same thing. Verse 19. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those who are outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel so that I might share in its blessings. 
Do you not know that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? So run then in such a way that you may win. Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as though I am beating the air, but I punish my body, I enslave it, so that after proclaiming to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Jump into verse 10, I mean chapter 10 with me. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea and they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them and there they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 of them fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happen to them to serve as an example, and they were written down as instructions for us. On whom the ends of the ages have come, if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength, but with the testing, he will also provide the way out so you will be able to endure it. This is God's word for us this morning. Would you bow your heads with me as we ask him for wisdom as we study this? Father, I ask not only for wisdom this morning for all of us here, but for understanding, and in understanding application. Lord, you don't just promise us wisdom, but you also promise us the ability and the foresight and the knowledge to apply it and to see a good fruit come from it. So I pray that here this morning in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. Amen. In the last 40 to 50 years, there's been an explosion of 12-step programs. Our country, every city, every small town, every county has 12-step programs, has some sort of an AA, some sort of a recovery program from an addiction that has overtaken our life. And it would almost seem the opposite, that a country so full, a country with so much blessing, a country with so much uh, wealth, would struggle, but at the same time, you sort of get it, and you say, well, actually, it makes sense, right? If I want, say, a donut, all I need do is drive or walk, probably drive because I'm getting a donut, <laughs> I'm not going to be walking, <laughs> to the Dunkin' Donuts, which is just a quarter mile from my house. If I lived out in the wilderness in a tent and I wanted a donut, I would just go on wanting that donut, for there would be no place to get it unless Dunkin' Donuts built a Dunkin' Donuts out in the middle of the wilderness. So you can see how having everything you could possibly want at your fingertips isn't all it's cracked up to be, is it? It's actually created in us a mentality, an inordinate imbalance in our desires. In fact, we are a people who struggle mightily with drinking, drugs, gambling, spending, rage, anger, overeating, undereating. And the truth is, there are many of us in here now who just feel out of control. And then there are those of us in here who say, I'm not any of that. Paul would come to you and say, how well do you control your tongue? How well do you get to a point where somebody says something to you and you just don't fire right back something mean to them. How well do you control your time? Do you use every minute of your day wisely? What about your thoughts? How are those doing? How are your thoughts? Don't ask me that one, Pastor. How about your spirit? How well do you control your spirit? How often do you make an impulsive decision or use impulsive words and wish you could take them back? You see, you don't have to be at the level of what our modern culture would would call addiction in order to see that every one of us in this room 
has some problem when it comes to self-control in some area of our life. Paul said, if you were listening, I have self-control. He just came out and said it. Remember last week, he said he was one of the strong. And now Paul says, I have self-control. So what is this self-control Paul speaking of? This is what I want us to look at today because this is what Paul is wanting the Corinthians to look at in this section of his letter. Paul's going to tell us the secret of how it is he has this self-control. He doesn't just tell him he has it and moves on. He's going to tell him how. First thing we see here is that it's not really self-control we're after. It's more self-balance. It is a balance of self. I said earlier the problem with addiction is an imbalanced desire for the things of this world. We have an imbalanced desire to be drunk or an imbalanced desire towards anger or an imbalanced desire towards lust. And Paul is going to show us that when it comes to self-control, what, what it really is we're going after is a balance of self. And he's going to use this illustration of the Olympic Games. And he says, we all know that athletes exercise in all things self-control. They don't just train on the weekends. They don't just play a couple hours a day, right? Especially Olympic athletes. It's everything. They eat, sleep, drink. They breathe it. Their, their workout regimen is crazy. They have to deny themselves pleasures and wants because it would not fit into their regimen. It would not benefit their bodies or their minds as they prepare for the games. And so Paul's going to use this um, illustration to help us to understand the idea of balance in your life. Not control, but balance. I want you to see here the contradiction between control and balance. Plato wrote in his writing The Republic, and when I say Plato, I don't mean the stuff you squeeze. Plato, just, you know, I'm just making sure we're on the same page there. That would be awkward. He says this about self-control. Isn't the phrase self-mastery or self-control a contradiction? Anyone who is his own master would also have to be his own slave and vice versa, since it's the same person who is the subject in all these expressions. How can the one thing that is the object of control also be the subject of control? How do you control yourself? When you know it's yourself that's a slave to the addictions and the desires of your heart, how do you then have self-control? Do you see the contradiction? It's not possible. We are fighting. When you hear the word self-control, you are constantly fighting between the side of you that says, here's the right thing to do, the ordered thing to do, the healthy thing to do, and here's what I actually want to do. The subject and the object. Paul says it's an imbalance that you're after, not control. He says you have an imbalanced desire of your heart. You have an imbalanced desire of your heart. You have made the urgent things in your life the important, and you have neglected the important things. Anybody here ever run a business or be in business and heard the phrase, the urgent uh, is never as important as the important, but the urgent is what gets taken care of? Why? Because it's loud. The urgent things are the, thing, are the flashing lights, right? The beeping noises, the things right there in your face saying, take care of us, take care of us. The important things are often very quiet. They're down here, and they're often the things you don't want to do as well because they're hard, because they're, they're maybe not your strength, and so you always put them off, but you know they're there, like paying the bills. Those are important, but they're not urgent. It only comes once a month. Or, I, don't know all, I don't know your life, but that's how it is for us. Once a month. It's not really urgent, but once that time comes, it comes real urgent, doesn't it? And if I neglect that payment every month, well, now all of a sudden the important thing has become urgent. In fact, it's become more than urgent because my water's been shut off. And now it's become a problem. It's no longer an urgency, it's now a problem because I ignored the important things and took care of little urgent things. I give you that example because this is what Paul is talking about. He says, Corinthian believers, Corinthian brothers and sisters, you are spending your time fighting and debating one another and filling your, your life and your moral values with urgent things, and you are forgetting the most important thing. You have an improper balance 
of self. You have an improper balance of self. So self-control isn't the problem, it's a balance of self that Paul is wanting to get at here. So what is that? What does that look like? Well, if we think of self-control as an exercise of the will over the feelings, you would have basically the American understanding of self-control. Well, I just need to logically look at it. Eating sugary and fatty foods makes me fat. I then can't fit into my pants, which makes me then have to buy more pants, which I don't have the budget for. I then can't run without sweating and breathing heavy, which then stinks, and I end up with a shorter lifespan because I'll die of a heart attack or something else. Okay, logically, I should never eat any fatty foods. Do we eat fatty foods? Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah. Like Blake said, lettuce and vegetables were not brought to us. No, enchiladas, tacos, plenty of donuts, and it was good and we ate it all. It's fantastic. So it's not about logic. It's not your will. Self-control is not, I will will myself to do this. No, there's actually a lot of your feelings and your emotions involved. Right? You see, you won't actually start working out and eating what is right until you go to the doctor and the doctor says, well, you have six months to a year to live. What can I do to change it, doc? Start working out and eating right. Now, all of a sudden, you're passionate. Why? Because you like life. You like it more than death, actually. You don't know what death is like, but you assume it's bad. And so because you are passionate about life, all of a sudden, that lettuce tastes good. You look at the donut or the bucket of ice cream, and it just looks like pig slop because you realize that means death. Your priorities have shifted. They have, there has been a rebalancing of yourself and you now have control over an area that you didn't, but you didn't use your mind or logic to do it. You used your passion. And Paul is saying here, Corinthians, what are you passionate about? Let me show you what I'm passionate about. I have given up my rights as a teacher, as a preacher of the word of God, and I have laid them down in order that I might be able to offer my services for free so that there won't be any obstacle to my ministry. I'm not saying this is for every pastor. I'm saying this is my call. This is my way to do it. And I am doing it so that you might know that I am operating solely under the power of the Holy Spirit so that you might see his truth through my life. Paul says, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training, right? So often we like to look at our Christian life and examine how we're measuring up as far as drinking or lust or I haven't looked at anything on the internet, I shouldn't for six months, I'm doing really well, I go into the men's group or I'm doing a daily Bible study. Paul says, everybody who's in the Olympics exercises. Everybody eats right. That's nothing special. No, if you, just to get there, that's the baseline. Why are you making the urgent the important things? That's not the important thing. But you are imbalanced in your perspective and so you look at your training as something that you boast about Corinthians or Americans. And he says, everyone does that. That's not what's important. So what is important? Well, I'm glad you asked. Paul's gonna answer that. He talks about getting a crown. He says that there's a prize. There's an imperishable wreath for those who run the race in a way as such to win. So what Paul is saying is, If an athlete sets aside all other desires and passions in order to win the game that he's training for, then you as a Christian must set aside all other desires and passions in order to pursue one passion that you are pursuing. You hear that? He's not saying you have to forego them. He's not saying you can't have other passions. No, this by the way has been preached in the church that we only have one focus, one desire. If you like anything else other than God, then you are subpar. Paul's not saying that. He's saying that unless Christ and the pursuit of him and his will for your life, unless that is first, 
then your life will be out of balance. It will always be out of balance. And you will wonder why you don't feel in control. It's because the thing that you should be passionate about, your creator, your father, is not the primary passion of your life. You are out of balance. We're told in Genesis 29, 20, right? We're told the story of Jacob and how he served her father Laban for seven years. Seven years. I pursued after my wife for four years, and that was rough. She just kept saying no. I went and dated someone else. I guess I didn't really serve you before. Yeah, that was not a good example. <laughs> Seven years he did back-breaking work for Rachel, right? And what does the Bible tell us? It says, they seemed like only a few days to him. Why? Because Rachel was his passion was his heart's desire, was his number one. And so the work and the service of pursuing her didn't matter. In fact, he liked her so much that when Laban gave him her sister, Leah, he went and worked another seven years to get her. Now that's impressive. Was it self-control? Did David just have incredible self-control? No. He had a balance and a passion, and what was most passionate about was his relationship with Rachel. And so the work and the denying of self and the sacrifices he would have to make, they seemed as if it went by in a few days because of what he was passionate about, because of what he set, he, because of what he set his heart on. So here's my question for us this morning, one of them. What are you most passionate about about the Lord? Is it theology? Is it that he saved you from hell? Is it that he saved you from an addiction that you used to have, but now you don't since you found him? Is it the warm, fuzzy feeling you get before you go to bed? Is it the scriptures? Is it, what is it that you can use? What is it about God that makes him the most important thing in your life, that puts him as number one? Is it your church? Is it your community? Is it the scriptures? Is it your favorite verse? Is it tradition? Is it family? I want you to think about it because here's the thing. Paul's going to tell us what his crown is. And if your crown is anything but what he says, it is a false crown. And this is hard news, right? Because we like to be individuals. Well, that's not it for me. I'm glad that's the way it was for Paul. But for me, it's worship. It's worship music. That's my thing. That's what makes God number one. And unless I stop, if I stop worshiping, then I start to notice my priorities slip. Well, it's a false crown. So I'm glad you love to worship. And that's part of it. That worship's actually part of what leads to us getting to the true imperishable wreath. But it's not the imperishable wreath. Take two guys, right? Stick them each in a room, white walls, no decorations, a desk, and a stack of 10,000 white blank papers. And tell them your job for 12 hours a day for the next seven days is to fold these papers in half and put them on this side of the desk. No breaks, no nothing. You just sit there and fold those papers. And at the end of the day, someone will come in, push them into a trash can, and throw them away. And then you'll do the same thing the next day. And you'll make minimum wage doing it. How excited are you to go to work tomorrow? How thrilled, how much purpose do you find, right? Like, how much meaning do you find in your job? Just one for seven days. That's that guy, right? That's this guy over here. The guy on the right is doing the same exact job, but he's told there'll be a $2 million check waiting for him when he's done. How do you think he folds that paper? Right? Big old smile on his face. Just can't fold it fast enough. When people ask him during the week when he gets off, how you doing? How do you like your job? I love it. I fold paper all day and I'm going to make $2 million in six more days. I love everything about my job. What's different? Passion. Their passion. Their perspective. That's what's different. The job's the same, so what's different? Unfortunately, in the church, we have too many Christians who believe that their relationship with Christ is paying them minimum wage. 
And so they just sort of sludge through this life and they sludge through the ministry and they sludge through church and they sludge through reading their Bible and witnessing to their neighbor and they're like, oh, that's minimum wage. Why do you hate this so much? I don't, I don't. I'm gonna get a mansion at the end and walk on golden streets. But right now it's tough. I'm told I have to suffer right now. What if Christians were more like the guy who knew he was getting $2 million and so they just loved every minute of their job and they pursued it with passion and they spoke about it with passion and it became their hope. We have something a lot more valuable than $2 million at the end of this life and yet we treat it as if it's something that we could take or leave. Paul was dealing with the same thing with the Corinthians And he says, what we go after, this prize, I'm going to tell you about that now. It's not a perishable crown, but an imperishable one. And so oftentimes in Christian circles, this has been looked at, and it's saying, well, of course he's talking about his what? His heavenly reward, right? This is what we say. This is fun. You're going to like this. He's talking about his heavenly reward, and that's what he's beating his body for, and that's what he's working really hard for. This is why I I make fun of the jewels and the crown so much, right? I hope it's not blasphemous. What I want us to see is if that is what we are pursuing, is our mansion in heaven, our gold streets, and our crowns, then you are missing the point. Paul is not talking about that kind of crown here. He's not saying, oh, I'm not going to get some wreath that the Olympic guys get. I get a gold crown when I get up to heaven, and I'm going to wear it around. So what is his crown? What is it? What is that thing that he is pursuing? And fortunately, Because we have the letters to Galatians and the Romans and the Thessalonians and the Philippians, guess what? We know what his crown is because he tells us. Romans 8.1. Now there is no condemnation, there is no condemnation ever for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? So the guy who wrote that is not the guy who's saying, I have to work really hard and beat my body and come under self-control and not do lustful things or bad things or drugs in order to get to heaven so I can get my crown so it'll have lots of jewels. That's not what he's saying. No, this is what he's saying. 1 Thessalonians 2. Remember how we were gentle among you. Remember how we were gentle among you. And this is what he writes. We loved you so much We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our very selves, because you had become dear to us. For what is our joy or the crown in which we will rejoice in the presence of the Lord Jesus? Is it not you? You are our joy and our crown. Philippians 4, 1. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. What Pastor Blake talked about during offering this morning, this is why we didn't even talk, we didn't connect on this. But this is what he's been talking about since last week, right? Right? Remember last week, the weak Christians, the weak conscious versus the strong Christians? He's saying, unless you lay down your rights, unless you sacrifice the things that, yes, you have a right to them in order to love another brother or sister, then the pursuit of Christ will never be number one in your life. You will always allow other things to slip in and take that spot. Unless your crown, your joy, your purpose is getting to share in the riches of the glory of God with others around you. Not just believers, but unbelievers. Not just your close friends, but all of those in the work, in the ministry. His prize, in verse 23, he says, I do all of this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessing." that I may get to share and see how the gospel is changing the lives of my community and the people around me. That was his prize. 
And that was the prize he was wanting to share with the Corinthians. It's why he reminds them in chapter 10 and says, we were given an example. We were given an example by Moses and his people of what not to do, of what of how not to act, how not to live, how not to love one another. We were given an example that we might do a better job of it. And then we were given the example in Christ Jesus on how to do it and how to live it out. (laughs) These things happened as an example for us. So how how, how does this work then? There's four things if you want self-control or self-balance. Okay, we'll close with this. First is scripture. Paul uses scripture right before verse 11, verses one through 10 is all scripture to try to show the Corinthians people, the Corinthian churches and Christians something about Christ. It says, Jesus set his face like a flint to go up to Jerusalem, never wavers, he never put it off. He, he, he showed utter self-control and discipline. What was his secret? Well, he's God, yes, he was God, but he's also fully human. What was his secret? It was scripture. When Peter cuts off the ear of the soldier, what does he say? He says, Peter, put your sword away. Don't you know that if I wanted to, I could call 12 legions of angels down right now? What are you doing? Stop it. In the desert, every time he is tempted with a new desire, a new passion, Satan's coming and saying, I'd like to give you a new number one. What does he do? He responds with scripture. It is written. It is written on the cross. Do you know that he was quoting Psalm 22, 1 on the cross? My God, my God. Why have thou forsaken me? Scripture. The first is scripture. If you want to have a self-controlled, self-balanced life, if you want to remember to keep the people of God a priority and the things of God a priority, you must dedicate yourself to the learning, studying, and memorizing of scripture. I don't know if there's anybody better at it in this room than Mr. Rod Brower right here. No, I'm going to call you out because it's amazing. He goes to our prisons here and brings people from their darkest place into the light of who Christ is, and he does it through the memorization and the study of Scripture. I've been so impressed by it. Secondly is the balanced expectation. It says, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Oftentimes we think when I become a Christian, I ought to be able to change. I should stop having these desires. I should stop struggling, right? The power of Christ is supposed to compel me to change. And yet I don't. I still want the things of the world. Well, that's because you still live in the world. You still have a sinful flesh. You still have a mind. When Christ came, he did not bring his kingdom fully. He says he will come back and bring his kingdom fully. But at this point in time where we live, we live in sort of two spaces. We live in the redeemed space of the spirit, and we also still live in this world. So you've got to have a balanced expectation. You can't be too pessimistic or too optimistic. You've got to be balanced and say, God, I realize that this is a process and I'm walking. Would you walk me with, through it? Would you walk with me through it? Third community. Look at verse 12. If you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. I can handle this on my own. I just don't want to be embarrassed. This is men's biggest problem in our culture. We don't do community well. We don't do community with guys who will hold us accountable. We'll do community with guys who will talk about sports and weather and dirty jokes and things that we like. But to to hang out and spend time with guys who will call us out on things that they see us sins with our wives or or, uh, inattention to our children or maybe we're doing something unethical at work. We don't want to hang out with those people because of the fear of what could be called out. And yet Paul is saying, no, you have to hang out with those people. Those people will make you strong. Those people will lift you up. Those will be the people that keep Christ in the pursuit of his people, number one, and keep you in self-control and balance. Lastly, God is faithful. Together with the temptation, he will always provide a way out that you will be able to endure it. I've heard it said, God won't give you anything you can't handle. And then I've also thought, sure he will. (laughs) He gives it stuff I can't handle all the time. But it's in my inability to handle it that I turn to him. And I give it to him and I say, God, this is too big. I can't handle this. This is too much for me. This is over my head. This is going to crush me. And God says, I'm going to walk you through it. I got you. 
He doesn't take it from me. He doesn't remove the situation. He doesn't smooth the road out. He says, I'm going to walk through you with it. Let's go. Jesus Christ. I'm going to call the band up here as we close. Jesus Christ had a crown too. He had a, he had a pursuit of something. He had a passion. Did you know that? Just like us. He had a crown that he was pursuing. It wasn't authority. It wasn't power. It wasn't knowledge. He was already God. So he had all of those things. So what was his pursuit? What was his passion? Us. You and me. We were his pursuit and his passion. And he gave up everything. He gave up all of his rights, all of his power, everything he had in pursuit of his passion. And when, and when the enemy and when the world came at him and began to give him other pursuits, he used scripture. And he relied on the, on the faithful community of his disciples, right, alongside him. And he understood that his father would be faithful to him. So in the garden when he was broken and he was crying out and saying, I can't do this, he remembered his passion and his pursuit. And he went through with it. Friends, scripture and worship and fellowship and the faithfulness of God are all important tools that help us focus on our true crown which is the witnessing and ministering of the gospel to the people that God brings across our lives. And we have to be more <laughs> excited. We have to see that calling as the $2 million reward and not a minimum wage job. Because if you see it as that, if it is that, then you have not had your mind renewed and transformed by Christ. And that's a hard saying. But here's what's cool. If you feel like that's you this morning, if you say, man, I feel like the minimum wage guy. I look at my relationship with God and this walk and church and all of the stuff, and it feels just like a weight rather than a, a, a light burden, which is what it's supposed to be. Well, then come forward this morning. Come forward, receive prayer. Talk with one of our prayer partners who are going to be up here on either side and do something about it. But don't just sit there. Don't get mad because I would dare say something like that. Well, he doesn't know me. <laughs> yes, I do. If you're struggling with that, come and be prayed over. Come and have someone, one of the pastors, one of our elders, one of the prayer partners pray with you that you would receive the mind of Christ because it is not something we can gain or work for. It is something which is given. You hear me? It is given to us. And I encourage you to get up and move today if that's you. Let's bow our heads in prayer and then we'll close with communion. Heavenly Father, Lord, bring boldness into this place now. We have heard your word. We have meditated on it and now it is time to move. For some, that will be a movement into communion with your body and your blood. For others, it'll be a movement to the altar. And for still others, it'll be a movement to come and know you for the first time. Whatever those movements are, would your Holy Spirit come and bring boldness in this room? That we would know you more. And that you would give that renewed mind, that transformed heart, Lord. In Jesus' name. your way up front just for a moment would you just hold right there a second have you heard the word of God today can you receive that word this morning into your heart would you put your hand over your heart with me and say Lord I want this word not just to be a word that I hear and then walk away from I want your word to impact my life and I ask for that in Jesus name as you partake of communion this morning, I could not help but listening to the Word of God and saying, you know, in my own life, it's easy to get off center. 
It's easy to get away from the passion that you once had for God and for his word and for prayer and that get replaced by other issues and other things. I want to invite you this morning as you do communion. Say, Lord, I want to recenter my life back on you. Would you rekindle the passion within me? In communion, we celebrate that he gave his body. He walked in complete surrender, passionate for you, to see you saved. He shed his blood. He be celebrating communion, the blood of the new covenant. It washes, it cleanses us, and it redeems us completely holy. So as you come this morning and you partake of the communion, take it. Find somebody to agree with, or as the pastor said, come forward, have people pray over you. But sit there and say, Lord, recenter my life on what's important for me. Help me to recenter, refocus. So, Father, this morning we say, Lord, we want this word to impact our lives. Just not this morning, but all throughout our journey this week. Holy Spirit, remind us. And then, Jesus, we're ever so grateful that you showed us a single, focused, passionate walk with the Father. Make that a reality in our life. Grateful that you showed us the way. Grateful that you made a way for us, that your body was broken, your blood was shed, so that we could receive forgiveness and be completely, totally restored. So come and, and get your element this morning and spend that time with the Lord. Come now and get your communion.